welcome again and uh, my name is amar khaled i'll be reading from anton chekhov's short story is one of my favorite writers and this is the second part of our literature from across the world series here every week we are reading literature from a different part of the world in english we also have urdu readings one is lined up for tomorrow uh with ahadali siddiqui another member of our uh, team and the day after on sunday we have a children's le- reading with sara pasha uh so while people are joining in let me just quickly introduce anton chekhov he was alive and active during the the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century so very turbulent and very interesting time in russia uh and the the stories i have selected today are really short pieces uh you know maximum of 10 minutes each uh and they they are a very very good depiction of how he would construct a larger story a narrative about russia and russian society out of very simple characters uh so i'll be reading one uh satirical story it's called chameleon the second one is a very uh heart wrenching very soulful story i would say it's called misery and the third one is grisha which is in a way a character sketch it's basically a description of a day from the point of view of a child very very interesting uh you know way to look at the world uh and uh a little bit more about chekhov chekhov is also you know uh, a very famous playwright uh some of his works a lot of his works in fact uh, all the classics you know that are associated with him the seagull three sisters uncle vanya they are still performed on the biggest stages around the world in big productions uh we at theater wale have also performed his plays uh in the past uh, a couple of years back um uh, so anyway that's uh that was a little bit about anton chekhov uh so i'll start with the reading the first story it's titled chameleon police inspector ohomelov uh, sorry one disclaimer before i start i have tried my best to uh you know find the right pronunciation for names and terms but you know if i make any errors please excuse uh so an important detail about the story is that the characters names have some derivative pun so police inspector akhumilov akhumilov is a de- is a derivation of crazed so the name is a pun police inspector akhumilov crossed the marketplace in a new great coat holding a bundle in his hand after him strode a red-haired constable carrying a sieve filled to the brim with confiscated gooseberries all around was silence there was not a soul in the marketplace the open doors of small shops and taverns gaped drearily out at god's world like so many hungry jaws there were not even any beggars standing near them all of a sudden the sound of a voice came to khumilov's ears so you'd bite would you you cur don't let it go lads biting is not allowed nowadays hold it ah a dog's whine was heard khumilov glanced in the direction of the sound and this is what he saw a dog came running out of the timber yard of the merchant pishujen on their on three legs pursued by a man in a starched print shirt and an unbuttoned waistcoat his whole body bent forward the man stumbled and caught hold of the dog by one of its hind legs there was another whine and again a shout of don't let it go drowsy faces were thrust thrust out of shops and in no time a crowd which seemed to have sprung out of the earth had gathered around the timber yard looks like a public disturbance your honor said the constable ohomilov turned and marched up to the crowd right in front of the gate of the yard he saw the above mentioned individual in the unbuttoned waistcoat who stood there with his right hand raised displaying a bleeding finger to the crowd the words i'll give it to you you devil 
seemed to be written on his tipsy countenance, and the finger itself looked like a banner of victory. Okhumilov recognized in this individual Kriyukin. This is another pun for a name. Kriyukin is derived from Kriyu Kriyu, pig's grunt. So this is a satirical piece, which is why this context is important. Okhumilov recognized in this individual Kriyukin, the goldsmith. In the very middle of the crowd, its four legs well apart, sat the culprit, its whole body a tremble. A white bourgeois pup with a pointed nose and a yellow spot on its back. In its tearful eyes was an expression of misery and horror. What's all this about? asked Akhumilov, shouldering his way through the crowd. What are you doing here? Why are you holding up your finger? Who shouted? I was walking along, Your Honor, as quiet as a lamb, began Kriyukin, coughing into his fist. I had big business about some wood with Mitri Mitrish here, and suddenly, for no reason whatever, that nuisance bit my finger. Excuse me, but I am a working man. Mine is a very intricate trade. Make them pay me compensation. Perhaps I won't be able to move this finger for a week. It doesn't say in the law, Your Honor, that we have to put up with ferocious animals. If everyone start to start biting, life won't be worth living. Mm, well, well, said Akhumilov severely, coughing and twitching, twitching his eyebrows. <coughs> <coughs> well, well, whose <coughs> dog is it? I shan't leave it at this. I'll teach people to let dogs run about. It's time something was done about gentlemen who are not willing to obey the regulations. He'll get such a fine, the scoundrel. I'll teach him what it means to let dogs and cattle of all sorts rove about. I'll show him what's what. Elderin, he continued, turning to the constable. Find out whose dog it is and draw up a statement. And the dog must be exterminated without delay. It's prob probably mad. Whose dog is it, I ask? I think it belongs to General Zhigalov, said a voice from the crowd. General Zigalov, hmm. help me off with my coat, Eldrin. Phew, how hot it is. It must be going to rain. He turned to Kriyukin. One thing I don't understand. How did it happen to bite you? How could it have got at your finger such a little dog and you such a strapping fellow? You must have scratched your finger with a nail and then taken it into your head to get paid for it. I know you fellows, a set of devils. He burnt, he burnt the end of its nose with a lighted cigarette for a joke, your honor, and it snapped at him. It's nobody's fool that Kriukin's always up to some mischief, your honor. None of your lies, Squinty. You didn't see me do it, so why lie? His honor is a wise gentleman. He knows who's lying and who's studying a God's truth. May the justice of the peace try me if I'm lying. It says in the law, all men are equal now. I have a brother in the police myself, if you want to know. Don't argue. No, that isn't the general's dog, remarked the constable profoundly. The general hasn't got a dog like that. All his dogs are pointers. Are you sure? Quite sure, your honor. And you're right. The general's dogs are expensive breed dogs. And this one, just look at it. Ugly, mangy cur. Why should anyone keep a dog like that? Are you crazy? If a dog like that were to find itself in Moscow or Petersburg, do you know what would happen to it? Nobody would worry about the law. It would be got rid of in a minute. You are a victim, Kriokin, and mind you, don't leave it at that. He must be taught a lesson. It's high time. Perhaps it is the generals after all, said the constable, thinking aloud. You can't tell by looking at it. I saw one just like it in his yard the other day. Of course it's the generals, came the voice from the crowd. Mm. Help me on with my coat, Elderin. I felt a gust of wind. I'm shivery. Take it to the generals and ask them. Say, I found it and sent it. And tell them not to let it into the street. Perhaps it's an expensive dog and it'll soon get spoiled if every brute thinks he can stick cigarettes into its nose. A dog's a delicate creature, and you put down your hand, blockhead. Stop showing everyone your silly finger. It's your own fault. Here comes the general's chef, we'll ask him. Hi there, Prokhor. Come here, old man. Have a look at this dog. Is it yours? What next? 
We have never had one like that in our lives. No need to make any more inquiries, said Akhumalov. It's a stray. What's the good of standing here talking? You have been told it's a stray, so a stray it is. Destroy it and have done with the matter. It isn't ours, continued Prokhor. It belongs to the general's brother who came a short time ago. Our general takes no interest in bourgeois. His brother, now, he likes. What has the general's brother come? Vladimir Ivanich, exclaimed Okhumilov, an ecstatic smile spreading over his features. Fancy that. And I didn't know. Come to stay? That's right. Just fancy. Wanted to see his brother. And I didn't know. So it's his dog. Very glad. Take it. It's a nice little doggy. Snap at his finger. <laughs> Come now, don't tremble. Grr, grr, the little rascal's angry. What a pup. Prokhor called the dog and walked out of the timber yard with it. The crowd laughed at Kriyokin. I'll have you yet. Okhomilov threatened him and wrapping his great coat around him, he continued his way across the marketplace. So this was the first story I was planning to share with. The second one <clears throat> is titled, <clears throat> excuse me. The second one is titled, Misery. To whom shall I tell my grief? The line opening epithet of sorts from Joseph's Lament. Twilight. Big flakes of wet snow are whirling lazily about the street lamps, which have just been lighted and lie in a thin soft layer on roofs, horses' backs, shoulders, caps. Iona Potapov, the sleigh driver, is all white like a ghost. He sits on the box without stirring, bent as double as the living body can be bent. If a regular snow drift fell on him, it seems as though even then he would not think it necessary to shake it off. His little mare is white and motionless too. Her stillness, the angularity of her lines and the stick-like straightness of her legs make her look like a halfpenny gingerbread horse. She's probably lost and thought. Anyone who has been torn away from the plow, from the familiar gray landscapes and cast into this slough, full of monstrous lights of unceasing uproar and hurrying people is bound to think. It is a long time since Iona and his nag have burst. They came out of the yard before dinner time and not a single fare yet. But now the shades of evening are falling on the town. The pale light of the street lamps changes to a vivid color and the bustle of the street grows noisier. Cabby, to the by box kia, Ayana hurts. Cabby, Ayana starts, and through his snow plastered eyelashes, he sees an officer in a military overcoat with a hood over his head. To the Vyborskia, repeats the officer. Are you asleep? To the Vyborskia. In token of assent, Iona gives a tug at the reins, which sends cakes of snow flying from the horse's back and shoulders. The officer gets into the sleigh. Iona clicks the horse, cranes his neck like a swan, rises in his seat, and more from habit than necessity, brandishes his whip. The mare cranes her neck too, crooks her stick like legs, and hesitatingly sets off. Where are you shoving, you devil? Iona immediately hears shouts from the dark mass shifting to and fro up before him. Where the devil are you going? Keep to the right. You don't know how to drive. Keep to the right, says the officer angrily. A, co a coachman driving a carriage swears at him. 
a pedestrian crossing the road and brushing the horse's nose with his shoulder looks at him angrily and shakes the snow off his sleeve. Iona fidgets on the box as though he were sitting on thorns, jerks his elbows and turns his eyes about like one possessed, as though he does not know where he is or why he is there. What rascals they all are, says the officer, jocosely. They're simply doing their best to run up, up against you or fall under the horse's feet. They must be doing it on purpose. Iona looks at his fare and moves his lips. Apparently he means to say something, but only a sniff comes out. What? inquires the officer. Iona gives a wry smile and straining his throat brings out huskily, my son. My son died this week, sir. Hmm. What did he die of? Ayana turns his whole body round to his passenger and says, Who can tell? It must have been from fever. He lay three days in the hospital and then he died. God's will. Turn around, you devil! Comes out of the darkness. Have you gone off your head, you old dog? Look where you're going! Drive on, drive on, says the officer. We won't get there till tomorrow at this rate. Hurry up. Anna cranes his neck again, rises in his seat, and with heavy grace, swings his whip. Several times he looks round at the officer, but the latter keeps his eyes shut and is apparently disinclined to listen. Putting his fare down at the Vyborskia, Iona stops by a restaurant and again sits huddled up on the box. Again, the wet snow paints him and his horse white. One hour passes, and then another. Three young men, two tall and thin, one short and hunchbacked, come up, railing at each other and loudly stamping on the pavement with their galoshes. Cabby to the police bridge, the hunchback shouts in a cracked voice. The three of us, 20 kopecks. Iona tugs at the reins and clicks to his horse. 20 kopecks is not a fair price, but he has no thoughts for that. Whether it is a ruble or whether it is five kopecks does not matter to him now so long as he has a fare. The three young men shoving each other and using bad language go up to the sleigh and all three try to sit down at once. The question remains to be settled, which are to sit down and which one is to stand. After a long altercation, ill-tempered and abused, they come to the conclusion that the hunchback must stand because he is the shortest. Well, drive on, says the hunchback in his cracked voice, settling himself and breathing down Ayana's neck. Cut along. What a cap you have got, my friend. You wouldn't find a worse one in all Petersburg. Laughs Ayana. It's nothing to boast of. Well, then nothing to boast of. Drive on. Are you going to drive like this all the way? Huh? Shall I give you one in the neck? My headaches, says one of the tall ones. At the Dukmasovs, yesterday, Vaska and I drank four bottles of brandy between us. I can't make out why you talk such stuff, says the other tall one angrily. You lie like a brute. Strike me dead, it's the truth. It's about as true as that a louse coughs. <laughs> Grins, Anna. Merry gentlemen. Phew. The devil take you, cries the hunchback indignantly. Will you get on, you old plague, or won't you? Is that the way to drive? Give her one with the whip. Hang it all. Give it her well. Iona feels behind his back the jolting person and quivering voice of the hunchback. He hears abuse addressed to him. He sees people, and the feeling of loneliness begin, begins little by little to be less heavy on his heart. The hunchback swears at him till he chokes over some elaborately whimsical string of epithets and is overpowered by his cough. His tall companion, companions begin talking of a certain Nadezhda Petrovna. Ayana looks round at them, waiting till there is a brief pause. He looks round once more and says, this week uh, my son died. We shall all die, says the hunchback with a sigh, wiping his lips <laughs> after coughing. 
come drive on drive on my friends i simply cannot stand crawling like this when will he get us there well you give him a little encouragement one in the neck do you hear you old plague i'll make you smart if one stands on ceremony with fellows like you you one may as well walk you hear you old dragon or don't you care a hang what we say and aina hears rather than feels and aina hears rather than feels a slap on the back of his neck <laughs> he laughs merry gentlemen god give you health cabman are you married asks one of the tall ones i <laughs> merry gentlemen the only wife for me now is the damp earth <laughs> the the grave that is here my son's dead and i am alive it's a strange thing that has come in at the wrong door instead of coming for me it went for my son and i not turns round to tell them how his son died but at that point the hunchback gives a faint sigh and announces that thank god they have arrived at last after taking his 20 kopecks ayona gazes for a long while after the revelers who disappear into a dark entry again he is alone and again there is silence for him the misery which has been for a brief space eased comes back again and tears his heart more cruelly than ever with a look of anxiety and suffering Aina's eyes stray restlessly among the crowds moving to and fro on both sides of the street. Can he not find among those thousands someone who will listen to him? But the crowds flit by heedless of him and his misery. His misery is immense, beyond all bounds. If Aina's heart were to burst and his misery to flow out, it would flood the whole world it seems, but yet it is not seen it has found a hiding place in such an insignificant shell that one would not have found it with a candle by daylight aina sees a house porter with a parcel and makes up his mind to address him what time will it, will it be friend he asks going on for 10 why have you stopped here drive on aina drives a few paces away blends himself up bend bends himself double and gives himself up to his misery he feels it is no good to appeal to people but before 5 minutes have passed he draws himself up shakes his head as though he feels a sharp pain and tugs at the reins he can bear it no longer back to the yard he thinks to the yard and his little mare as though she knew his thoughts falls to trotting An hour and a half later Aina is sitting by a big dirty stove on the stove on the floor and on the benches are people snoring their air is full of smells and stuffiness Aina looks at the sleeping figures scratches himself and regrets that he has come home so early i have not earned enough to pay for the oats even he thinks that's why i am so miserable a man who knows how to do his work who has had enough to eat and whose horse has had enough to eat is always at ease in one of the corners a young cabman gets up clears his throat sleepily and makes for the water bucket want a drink ayana asks him seems so may it do you good but my son is dead mate you hear this week in the hospital it's a queer business ayona looks to see the effect produced by his words but he sees nothing the young man has covered his head over and is already asleep the old man sighs and scratches himself just as a young man had been thirsty for water he thirsts for speech his son will soon have been dead a week and he has not really talked to anybody yet he wants to talk of it properly with deliberation he wants to tell how his son was taken ill how he suffered what he said before he died how he died 
He wants to describe the funeral and how he went to the hospital to get his son's clothes. He still has his daughter, Anisia, in the country. And he wants to talk about her too. Yes, he has plenty to talk about now. His listener ought to sigh and exclaim, exclaim and lament. It would be even better to talk to women, though they are silly creatures. They blubber at the first word. Let's go out and have a look at the mirror, Iona thinks. There is always time for sleep. You will have sleep enough, no fear. He puts on his coat and goes into the stables where his mare is standing. He thinks about oats, about hay, about the weather. He cannot think about his son when he is alone. To talk about him with someone is possible, but to think of him and to picture him is insufferable anguish. Are you munching? Ayana asks his mare seeing her shining eyes. There, munch away, munch away. Since we have not earned enough for oats, we will eat hay. Yes, I have grown too old to drive. My son not to be driving, not I. He was a real cabman. He ought to have lived. I and I silent for a while, and then he goes on. That's how it is, old girl. Uzma Ionesh is gone. He said goodbye to me. He went and died for no reason. Now, suppose you had a little cold and you were own mother to that little cold. And all at once, that same little cold went and died. You'd be sorry, wouldn't you? The little mare munches, listens, and breathes on her master's hands. Iona is carried away and tells her all about it. <clears throat> the, the third and final story, it's a really, really short one. Uh, it's titled Grisha. <clears throat> Grisha. A chubby little boy, born only two years and eight months ago, was out walking on the boulevard with his nurse. He wore a long padded snowsuit, a large cap with a furry knob, a muffler, and wool-lined galoshes. He felt stuffy and hot. And in, ad in addition, the waxing sun of April was beating directly into his face and making his eyelids smart. Every inch of his awkward little figure with its timid, uncertain steps bespoke a boundless perplexity. Until that day, the only universe known to Grisha had been square. In one corner of it stood his crib. In another stood nurse's trunk. In the third was a chair. And in the fourth, a little icon lamp. If you looked under the bed, you saw a doll with one arm and a drum. Behind nurse's trunk were a great many various objects, a few empty spools, some scraps of paper, a box without a lid, and a broken jumping jack. In this world, besides nurse and Grisha, there often appeared Mama and the cat. Mama looked like a doll, and the cat looked like Papa's fur coat. Only the fur coat did not have eyes and a tail. From the world which was called the nursery, a door led to a place where people dined and drank tea. There stood Grisha's high chair, and there hung the clock made only in order to wag its pendulum and strike. From the dining room, one could pass into another room with big red chairs. There on the floor glowered a dark stain for, pit, for which people still shook their forefingers at Grisha. Still farther beyond lay another room where one was not allowed to go and in which one sometimes caught glimpses of Papa, a very mysterious person. The functions of Mama and Nurse were obvious. They dressed Grisha, fed him, and put him to bed. But why Papa should be there was incomprehensible. 
Aunty was also a puzzling person. She appeared and disappeared. Where did she go? More than once, Grisha had looked for her under the bed, behind the trunk, and under the sofa. But she was not to be found. In the new world, where he now found himself, where the sun dazzled one's eyes, there were so many papas and mamas and aunties that one scarcely knew which one to turn to run to. But the funniest and oddest things of all were the horses. Grisha stared at their moving legs and could not understand them at all. He looked up at nurse, hoping that she might help him to solve the riddle, but she answered nothing. Suddenly, he heard a terrible noise. Straight toward him down the street came a squad of soldiers marching in step with red faces and sticks under their arms. Grisha's blood ran cold with terror. And he looked up anxiously at his nurse to inquire if this were not dangerous. But Nursey neither ran away nor cried. So he decided it must be safe. He followed the soldiers with his eyes and began marching in step with them. Across the street ran two big long-nosed cats, their tails sticking straight up into the air and their tongues lolling out of their mouths. Grisha felt that he too ought to run, and he started off in pursuit. Stop! Stop! cried Nursi, seizing him roughly by the shoulder. Where are you going? Who told you to be naughty? But there sat a sort of nurse with a basket of oranges in her lap. As Grisha passed her, he silently took one. Don't do that, cried his fellow wayfarer, slapping his hand and snatching the orange away from him. Little stupid. Next, Grisha would gladly have picked up some of the slivers of glass that rattled under his feet and glittered like icon lamps. But he was afraid that his hand might be slapped again. Good day, Grisha heard a loud, hoarse voice say over his very ear. And looking up, he caught sight of a tall person with shiny buttons. To his great joy, this man shook hands with Nursi. They stood together and entered into a conversation. The sunlight, the rumbling of the vehicles, the horses, the shiny buttons, all struck Grisha as so amazingly new and yet unterrifying that his heart overflowed with delight, and he began to laugh. Come, come. Come, come, he cried to the man with the shiny buttons, pulling his coattails. Where to? asked the man. Come, Grisha insisted. He would have liked to say that it would be nice to take Papa and Mama and the cat along too, but somehow his tongue would not obey him. In a few minutes, Nurse turned off the boulevard and led Grisha into a large courtyard where the snow still lay on the ground. The man with shiny buttons followed them. Carefully avoiding the puddles and lumps of snow, they picked their way across the courtyard, mounted a dark, grimy staircase, and entered a room where the air was heavy with smoke and a strong smell of cooking. A woman was standing over a stove frying chops. The cook and nurse embraced one another. And sitting down on a bench with the man, began talking in low voices. Bundled up as he was, Grisha felt unbearably hot. What does this, what does this mean? He asked himself, gazing about. He saw a dingy ceiling, a two-pronged oven fork, and a stove with a huge oven mouth gaping at him. Mama! he wailed. Now his nurse called to him. Be good. The cook set a bottle, two glasses, and a pie on the table. The two women and the men, man with the shiny buttons, touched glasses and each had several drinks. The man embraced alternately the cook and the nurse. Then all three began to sing softly. Grisha stretched his hand toward the pie and they gave him a piece, ate it, and watched his nurse drinking. He wanted to drink too. Give Nursi Kriv, he begged. The cook gave him a drink out of her glass. He screwed up 
His eyes frowned and <coughs> coughed for a long time after that, beating the air with his hands while the cook watched him and laughed. When he reached home, Grisha explained to Mama the walls and his crib where he had been and what he had seen. He told it less with his tongue than with his hands and his face. He showed how the sun had shone, how the horses had trotted, how the terrible oven had gaped at him, and how the cook had drunk. That evening, he could not possibly go to sleep. The soldiers with their sticks, the great cats, the horses, the bits of glass, the basket of oranges, the shiny buttons, all this lay piled on his brain and oppressed him. He tossed from side to side chattering to himself and finally unable longer to endure his excitement, he burst into tears. Why, he has, a, he has fever, cried Mama, laying the palm of her hand on his forehead. What can be the reason? The stove wept Grisha. Go away, stove. He has eaten something that has disagreed with him, Mama concluded, and shaken by his and shaken by his impressions of a new life, apprehended for the first time, Grisha was given a spoonful of castor oil by Mama. Thank you very much for joining in. We will announce, uh, you know, the writer we will be uh, whose work we'll be reading next week uh, very soon. Please follow our Facebook page, our Insta page. Thank you, everyone, for your support and tuning in uh, and we'll meet you again soon. Love this. Take care.